like to welcome Professor Catherine Landell from Oxford University. Uh, she, many of you may know that she actually has an observatory quite near here on the grounds of St. Tipkins, and uh, she has a network of these observatories around the world. And it's the envy of any amateur astronomer. So I did see it once, and I'm very impressed by it. But uh, she's going to tell us why she has this observatory, and uh, well, I look forward to hearing you talk. <coughs> Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you very much, uh, especially to Stella, for loaning me her laptop uh, that would talk to, uh, uh, to the projector. I have many reasons to be grateful to the AAVSO, and uh, I've uh, added a new one to that list today. Well, it's a particular pleasure to be talking about spectroscopy in the Rainbow Nation. I love spectroscopy for reasons that you'll see, and I love this particular nation for many reasons. I'm going to be describing the project that Ian has mentioned, which uh, my colleague Steve Lee over in the corner there and I have been working on a huge amount. This image is a reminder that serendipity can play a big role in getting very special data. But what I'm going to be describing to you is a very strategic and a very purposeful project designed to study a particular phenomenon that we see in the night sky. I want to tell you about the, a microquasar whose name is SS433. And I'm showing you this image of the night sky taken from Steve Lee's back garden in Australia with his DSLR camera to serve as something of a finding chart. Those red circles over there indicate the location of SS433, this microquasar that I'm going to talk about. Now, if you were to point a radio telescope at that particular location in the sky, and if you were to make successive radio images of the object at the centre of those red rings, and if you could colour code the radio emission that you observe, um, red or blue, according to where the material is going away from us on Earth or towards us on Earth, this is what you would see. Um, What's actually going on here is that we're looking at a black hole system which is accreting matter from its neighbouring star which it is orbiting around. Plasma jets are being squirted out in opposite directions, just as in the powerful quasars in the distant universe. It's a galactic scale model of that distant extragalactic uh, quasar phenomenon. What's happening is that as the plasma is squirted away in opposite directions, the directions along which the plasma is squirted process, tracing out a cone in space. So the picture to have in mind is that the axis along which the jet plasma is launched is tracing out exactly the same kind of shape that the paddle of a kayakist would be tracing out as they paddle a kayak. <clears throat> Some people find it a little bit easier to take in uh, this cartoon in this sort of form, where you squirt out oppositely directed pairs of packets of plasma, which once they're launched, keep moving ballistically towards Earth or away from Earth. By ballistic, I mean they're not accelerating and they're not decelerating. If you just watch a particular blue uh, blob there, you'll see it's moving at a straight line in constant motion, not accelerating, not decelerating. Now that's all great, but the problem is, wonderful though radio telescopes are, they cannot give us information about directionality. They can't colour code red and blue to tell us which way things are moving. So we have to think again, and the best thing to do, well, let me just show you, uh, for starters, what a radio image does look like. This is a radio image of that object, SS433, made with the VLA radio telescope, the very large array radio telescope, and you'll recognise the zigzag curly corkscrew shape, um, which is, thank you, uh, which, is, um, which was shown on the previous cartoon movie. That's great, but you'll notice there's no red and blue directional information. So, how can we extract information about how jets are launched from this black hole system? It's an important coup, if we can, because that will help us unlock how jets are launched in quasars in the distant universe. So the strategy is to use an optical telescope 
equipped with a spectrograph to split up the light coming from the central launch point here. So I'm now going to show you the sort of optical spectrum you get if you do just that. So the, the light on our spectrographs, which I'll explain to you in a moment, is split up into wavelength, which is along this bottom axis. The wavelength here is about 5,800 angstroms, and this is about 8,500 angstroms, approximately. And for those of you who aren't familiar with, with spectra, let me just tell you what we're looking at here. The tallest line here is the, the Barmer H alpha line. So this is a really common line that you see whenever you've got hydrogen. And the universe is stuffed full of hydrogen. There's a lot of it about. It's very easy to observe. So this line at 6563 angstroms is a winner. It's a really good one to study. In the context of this object, it's called the stationary H alpha line because it doesn't move that much. But I'll return to that later in my talk. This line here is also from the exact same atomic hydrogen transition, but it's blue shifted to shorter wavelengths. This one here is red shifted. It's coming from hydrogen plasma that's moving away from us, and so it's red shifted to longer wavelengths. The fact that this, these lines are seen at shorter wavelengths and at longer wavelengths comes about because we're dealing with hydrogen that's moving towards Earth and moving away from Earth. I'm sure it's familiar to many folk here, but if you have a particular type of atom here, this is sodium, which gives us the characteristic orange street lamps, we know that gives us very specific lines in a frequency spectrum. The key thing to realise is that if we put one of these orange street lamps in, uh, if, if we looked at a particular spectrum, and this is what we saw, but then we took that same street lamp, nailed it to the back of the space shuttle, skipping over technical details here, if that space shuttle was moving away from us, then we would see those orange lines move to red lines, move longer in wavelengths. And so the key point to realise is that if you've got a spectrograph, and if you get a spectrum with lines in it, you have got yourself a speedometer to use in space to measure dynamics. And that is a great leap forward. It's a really important thing to do. In the case of SS433, it's been realized that that blue shifted and red shifted uh, pair of emission lines actually move successively. The cycle is about every six months. It's a bit under six months. Um, this was first realized in the late 70s, early 1980s was discovered by David Clark and Paul Murden, who wrote a lot of the seminal papers on the optical spectra of um, uh, this object, observed using the AAT, the telescope that Steve controls. Martin Rees and Andy Fabian figured out that the underlying fundamental mod model must be these jets of plasma, hydrogen plasma squirting in opposite directions. And in a marvel of popular culture, Discussion of this object and its remarkable moving lines even got onto the US television show Saturday Night Live. For those for whom equations are not their thing, please stay with me. These equations represent those sinusoidal graphs that you saw in my preceding slide. Just very briefly, this is what they're telling you about. Z plus is just your, your redshift how the wavelength has changed. Z minus is your blue shift. Gamma and beta are things that tell you about the speed. So look at those and think, aha, that's just the speed at which the plasma is moving. Theta here is the angle of that cone that is traced out by the moving jet axis. I is the angle of the symmetry axis of that cone. And phi is just a phase, what fraction of the cycle you are through. That pair of equations, well, that's a pair of equations, but writing them out in full, that does a good job of describing the equation, the, the um, observations, that sinusoidal graph that I showed you on the previous slide. That has been known for a few decades, but actually there's something clever and cunning that you can do with it by just adding together these two equations. You'll notice these terms are identical, so the minute you add them together, they annihilate. 
Remember I said that gamma was something that just tells you about the speed at which the plasma is moving. It's a quantity we normally refer to as the Lorentz factor, but basically it's the speed. If you add together the simultaneously measured redshift and the simultaneously measured blue shift, in other words, how far your moving lines have moved across your spectrum, you have measured the speed. So again, you can if you can measure a spectrum with emission lines, and you know what those emission lines are, you've got yourself a celestial speedometer. And so this is something that we use a lot. That's written in a different form. The speed totally comes from the simultaneously measured redshift and blue shift. This is an incredibly powerful tool. And again, if equations are not your thing, don't worry, but please know those equations are why I started the project that I'm now about to describe to you. This project is called the Global Jet Watch. The word jet will be obvious, the word watch will be obvious, we've seen that something moves, but it's important that the word global is in there too. Those of you who observe by night will be aware that if you plot the observability or the, uh, the, the air mass or the observability of a particular target at a particular location, um, you'll, at favourable times of the year and at favourable locations, that object will be above your horizon for perhaps six hours, maybe seven, depending on where you are and where it is. But of course, for a large fraction of a 24-hour period, no data, because of things like the object is below your horizon. So the way to overcome this is to plonk telescopes in various other parts of the world, separated in longitude. This red one uh, is in Chile, green one here in South Africa, um, orangey one is in southern India, light blue is on the left-hand side of Australia, royal blue is on the, uh, sorry, uh, light blue is on uh, the left-hand side, royal blue is on the right-hand side of Australia. And so with such a set setup of telescopes, on, if you want to observe a particular object in the galaxy over here, because our planet spins, if you set up telescopes that are themselves separated in longitude, they will take it in turns to be able to collect data on your object of interest. So that was the idea, that was the plan. Fortunately, amazingly, I was awarded a research prize by the Royal Society in London and by the Leverhulme Trust in the UK. Research prizes mean freedom to do bold ideas and Global Jet Watch was the bold idea that came out of those prizes. Bold ideas involve the gritty reality of concrete and broken fingernails and lots of hard work. This is the night sky over our Chile telescope. This is the back end of the Chile telescope and the crucial piece of equipment here is that we have a manifold that can divert the light to any one of four ports. You'll see here um, a filter wheel and an imaging camera and this is the bit that makes our spectroscopy work. A fibre injection and guiding unit made by Sheliac in France, guider camera there and this uh, this thing here is an optical fibre which, if you follow it down, um, down the side of the telescope, here we are, down the side, you end, up, um, you end up plugging into the back of this shiny red box, which is our spectrograph. Steve Lee designed and built these spectrographs and they're just fabulous. The throughput is very, very high because the dispersing element inside the spectrograph is one of these fancy volume phase holographic gratings, VPH grating uh, for short. What's particularly special about these is that they're not like the traditional etched sort of uh, grating, which attenuate the amplitude to give you a phase shift to give you the dispersed light. They give, but, but these VPH gratings have a periodicity in the refractive index. So you get a phase shift without a loss of amplitude, and hence the throughput of these spectrographs on telescopes that are only half a metre in diameter is just stupendous, and we get fantastic spectra on all of our telescopes through these. We didn't, this project is not just about itself. It's not just about spectroscopy, it's not just about galactic black holes. 
By design, from the outset, there are spin-offs in this project, which is that most of the telescopes are in schools. These are girls at our school in rural southern India, girls here in South Africa. And it's incredibly important to be able to share our science, as Patricia Whitelock emphasised to us this morning. This particular school in rural southern India was founded by the government of India so that the bright children of rural families who would otherwise be working on the land could receive a formal education. Over half of them are first generation literates. Before local bedtime, they have a chance to play with a shiny telescope. They have enormous fun doing so. And when they're having fun, they're in a place where they can learn. We're very, very happy about this. And of course, they're gaining skills. They're learning that technology and computers are things that, far from being things to be afraid of, they are things to be embraced and enjoyed. This is an email from a student at the India School that I got uh, some time ago. Dear Madam, hope you saw the image of Jupiter, which I think is a planet. It was magnificent. We even saw, and then there's a bunch of targets you'll recognise, or Northern Hemisphere people will recognise. Guess what, Madam? Every night in my dream, I play only with stars and nebulas. Once I, forget, once I enter the observatory, I forget everything. I feel I have entered heaven. This is a school where the uh, one day three girls newly arrived at the school put their heads round the door um, of the observatory while I was there in the daytime and said to me, Madam, Madam, how come you're not afraid to be in here by yourself? And I said, well, I'm not afraid, but tell me why you think I might have been afraid. Because of the machinery and all, Madam. What if the telescope jumps out at you and attacks you? For people who've worked on the land, for people who haven't received a formal education, they associate machinery with being something that can maim. And so, of course, that night, I invited them to come back once it was dark, and they were exploring craters on the moon. They were driving the telescope. And, of course, it moved like a ballerina. And they were terribly impressed and learned a big and important lesson about what technology can do. It hasn't been easy to do this. We faced a number of challenges, little ones, which they and their sharp teeth do a lot of damage. That used to be a focusing cable. Um, one of the biggest problems we faced in India was the spiky and dangerous local mains electricity. There were times when the lights were out completely, when there was no power whatsoever. There were times when the power was switched on, and when it was on, the adjective I'm going to use is camera fryingly bad. <laughs> we lost a lot of expensive e equipment because of the dangerous electricity supply out there. Now, if it's inconvenient and vexing for Steve Lee and myself to, to experience this, it's uh, salutary to remember that this is everyday life for people out there. And so we decided we should build a solar farm. So this is a picture of the observatory at the India School. This is their academic block, school girls. And up here, there's a flat school roof where we decided it would be great to install solar panels. Down here is an area that is in shade for all but about 10 or 15 minutes every day. We decided that would be a great place for our batteries. This is the horse that delivered the steel out of which we made um, this uh, battery shed and in this battery shed, we, uh, this is Steve Lee and our friend and colleague Chris McCowage who helped us uh, with the solar installation. We have 2,000 amp hours of batteries um, to, uh, to store up uh, what we collect with, uh, these are the freight, that's the observatory, this is the flat bit of school roof, and um, we've got 12 square meters of photovoltaic panels, um, and, uh, the DC is now entirely run, the observatory is now entirely run on DC electricity. Meanwhile, the school has learnt that you can collect energy out of the sky. It falls out of the sky from our nearest star so that by night we can observe, sorry to any solar astronomers, but we can observe more interesting stars across the galaxy by night. It's a fantastic system and uh, running an observatory from solar power is the way to go, I'm convinced of it. 
Another uh, big challenge was an 8.4 magnitude earthquake in Chile, um, but we got back on sky after 25 hours. And let me remind you, great big emission line, stationary H-alpha, blue shifted H-alpha line, red shifted H-alpha line. Mm -hmm. The rather weird pattern here is because the, mo the monitor um, crashed to the floor of the observatory while the observatory floor was coming up to it. So there was quite a lot of damage. The optics of the uh, observatory was fine, but sadly the, the gears and the mount were a bit damaged. But we overcame these challenges and we're getting fantastically gorgeous data for our science. You can see how the lines move in quick succession, um, uh, spreading out uh, in redshift as the, the object goes from being more or less in the plane of the sky to becoming um, more and more uh, closer to Earth's line of sight. I don't know how clearly you can see on this, this is a bunch of stacked spectra, this is the stationary H alpha line, and I hope you can just at least make out the moving lines here if you stack all these spectra together. There are various different ways of doing it, um, some of which show more clearly than others. These are two spectra of, the, uh, of SS433 taken just about 23 hours apart at one observatory. And you can see the changes are really quite dramatic. So if you only observe from a mono-longitude mono observatory, you miss out on a lot of the action for these relatively small, relatively lightweight, highly dynamical systems in our galaxy. So to have the multi-longitude network is a really wonderful thing. So these are the data that we collected. This was a huge amount of activity in the early days. And we've been able to establish a number of the, uh, the key parameters in this system. I just want to briefly draw your attention to this stationary H alpha line. You can see bits squirting off, uh, at least I hope you can on this. I've got a slightly different rendering, which I'll show you in a minute. The stationary H alpha line in SS433 has long been known to be modulated by orbital period. It swings from side to side with orbital period. That's been known for some time. But I just want to show you how time resolution and spectral resolution, getting fine detail on the wavelengths, is really important for uncovering the underlying dynamics. So these two different, the red and the blue um, graphs that I'm showing here, are actually arising from two very different dynamical situations. The one on the right, coloured in blue, is what you might expect to get if you've got um, two bodies, each emitting hydrogen, in orbit around one another. The Doppler effect meaning that there's actual observable change in wavelength. At, low resu at high resolution, it's very easy to see that that's completely distinct from the situation we have on the, on the left, which is a pair of lines absolutely static in wavelength, but changing in intensity with orbital period. At low resolution, you cannot distinguish between these. And so it's very important to get that right. Um, this is what uh, the stationary H alpha line of SS433 looks like when it's relatively quiescent and well behaved. You see there's one broad line shown in black at the bottom and then there's a pair of lines. If we actually show a whole succession of spectra there, the broad line wobbles around with orbital period. That's to do with the accretion disk from which the jets are launched. But you'll see there's a pair of little lines that are pretty much static in wavelength arising from a circum binary ring. That is to say, hydrogen that is outside of the inner binary. And if I press that, so the, the white paths here, if you look on the left for a second, that's an overhead view of a binary star system. On the right is a side-on view of the exact same system. And the green line is a circum binary. Thank you. That orbits around and outside of that inner binary. So discovering that and exploring that in SS433 has been pretty exciting. That's when SS433 is quiescent and well behaved. When it's not quiescent and not well behaved, we see these things spurting off to the right um, from that stationary H alpha line. So these are the moving jet lines that we see here. And then amazingly at times, we see these bits spurting off significantly increasing their wavelength away from the central wavelength of H-alpha. When things significantly move away, that's because they're speeding up. 
What's happening there? Well, amazingly, if you contrast the dates when you see those diversions from the H-alpha line and you look at what just comes after that, that coincides with spikes at radio wavelengths telling you that you've got a dramatic flare in the system. And this, this is from completely independent measurements. Ritan is a telescope, a radio telescope in Russia operated by Sergei Trushkin. And so one of the things we enjoy studying with this system is when flaring events happen in microquasars. We see intriguing behaviour and diverting behaviour in the accretion disk lines, and we also see uh, characteristic behaviour in uh, the, uh, how the jet speed um, behaves. We can measure those speeds exactly because of those equations I showed you at the start of my talk. I'll just show you very briefly what happened when we did a quasi-simultaneous observation with the uh, millimetre radio interferometer in northern Chile, Chatnantor Plateau, uh, the ALMA telescope. This was just a couple of weeks after that earthquake that I mentioned earlier. Uh, ALMA observed uh, for us. We'd taken a lot of spectroscopy in the preceding year and we thought it would be good fun to take our equations, which give us the speed at which plasma is launched, and our kinematic model, and then overlay it on the image that we got from this multi-billion dollar telescope, ALMA. And actually, our five little telescopes around the world give you uh, the red and the blue dots. You can see it overlaid there. Underneath is the gray scale from ALMA. So we think we're cracking quite a lot about this system. In my two remaining minutes, I'll just tell you about a different kind of object that we've observed, uh, Nova Sag. Uh, last year in a different bit of the galaxy. Um, this was an optical, a hundred second optical spectrum uh, that I took one night before uh, going to bed in England just after Steve Lee had sent me an email saying there's a Nova gone off, might be fun to take a spectrum or two. That was breakfast time the following day at a different uh, telescope around the corner and uh, successively we were, this is still just a 100 second with a uh, uh, exposure with a half metre telescope. So we're getting fantastic signal to noise and uh, here is not just Stella loaning me her laptop but the data contributed by AAVSO is something that we are, these uh, up and down things uh, correlate very interestingly with when we see emission lines and when we see absorption lines in our spectra. So, Stella, thank you again. Um, and uh, I'll just, this is um, a movie that I don't particularly have time to explain, but it, it just illustrates how we're able to follow the evolution um, of this uh, particular Nova explosion that happened a couple of years back. We're really, calibration is everything, as we'll hear tomorrow afternoon when you're dealing with spectroscopy. I'm just going to show you a movie now of um, what spectroscopists on the left will recognise is um, uh, the telluric feature. Um, that can be a friend because you can use it to sanity check your wavelength calibration. So this is to do with the Earth's atmosphere and shouldn't move unless you're on a rocket, which we're not. Um, but here, this is uh, wind from uh, shown here in oxygen. So if you just watch what happens, you'll see the, the trough on the left remains rock, remains rock solid while this peak uh, moves further and further away from its rest wavelength, indicating it's increasing and increasing in speed. Well, I've galloped through um, a description of uh, some of the activities of the project. Um, the, there's uh, more information at our website there, but I'll be talking a little bit uh, tomorrow about um, how you might wish to uh, join in with some of the monitoring uh, that we're doing. But I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. I think what I'll do is uh, allow everything to go five minutes further. So if somebody would like to ask questions. My laptop apologises. <laughs> I've had the privilege of being in your observatory in town. Could you tell us why you chose to put your observatory in the middle of a major city in the shadow of a very large mountain? I'd be very happy to. So, obviously, the ideal location, if, if it's just optimising the astronomy uh, that you're doing, is, is to be um, in a very dry place, in a very dark place, and preferably at the top of a pointy mountain. Such sites anti-correlate with schools. We didn't want this project just to be about the astronomy. 
we wanted to share the activity that we were doing with schools. Spectroscopy lends itself to separating out contaminating signals because they often have a very clear um, spectroscopic signature which we can obviously uh, trivially subtract out. So because we could do it in, in schools, we wanted to do it in schools. That, that is every bit as much a driver for this project as our astrophysical research goals. And why that school? Why that school? Because I interviewed a bunch of schools, spoke to the headmistresses, spoke to the science teachers, um, and uh, their answers dispersed their suitability to host the, uh, the telescope. So an example of a school I did not choose was one where the headmistress told me, in response to my question, why would you like to host one of our telescopes, the answer came back, oh, we want to brag to our neighbours about having a link with Oxford. Well, that was just the last thing I was looking for. The headmistress at this school said, in answer to the same question, why would you like to host a telescope at your school? She said, I want to see the girls of my school engage in science. Astronomy is a great way in. I want to see the girls of my school grow up to wear the white coats in South Africa in the future and become the medics and the scientists of the future. I thought that was a great answer and I didn't shatter her illusions that actually we don't wear white coats. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, another question. So I'm looking forward to talking to you at the break uh, because I work on light pollution, so being in the city is perfect, right? So I'm really interested in what you think the connection is doing that. So you showed down to about 550 nanometers or so. How far down does it go? Does it go to 400? Or? Well, at present, we only have this, the red arm that you've seen on this, this spectrograph. I'm currently trying to raise money for a blue arm so that we go down to rather closer to uh, 400 nanometers. But to answer what I think is really behind your question, the, the question of light pollution, we've, Steve Lee and I have been working very closely with Francois Cochard at Sheliac Instruments, and we've designed and developed together a dual fiber uh, uh, fibre injection and guiding unit that enables the simultaneous collection of a sky fibre and a target plus sky fibre. So those, those will get laid in parallel across the, CD, the CCD and then you'll just subtract your sky spectrum from your target plus sky. So that's, that's the trajectory we're headed on. So you'll measure, so you'll measure that sky spectrum and you can see it changing? Oh, totally. No, well, you, you see it changing with altitude and azimuth of the no, no. telescope. Sorry. Okay. I'm interested in the light pollution itself and whether you see a change over 10 years. Oh, totally. Yeah, because people change light bulbs and, you know, then you get a different spectrum. So, yeah, we definitely see changes. Okay, you better stop. Sorry. But uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I'm fascinated by this subject, which I did a little bit of work on myself in the early days just before we knew much about the very amazing structure. Anyway, um, I'd like now to call on Vanessa McBride.